Well, it's good to see you in the light this, today. As last week, we did not get to see each other in the light. We were in the darkness when the lights went off. So I am behind. Uh, today's lesson was last week's lesson. So that means you're going to get this morning's lesson for next week's lesson, if you follow my drift. Because in the 8 o'clock class, we went, went right ahead. And listen, the Lord is the very good to us. He is uh, always fair. It just so happened that in the 8 o'clock class this morning, right after we got started, the lights went off again this morning. <laughs> so the Lord is good to you know, do unto others as He has done unto others, <laughs> if you know what I mean. You were in the early bird room when it all happened. That's right. All right. Well, it's good to see y'all. As we get picking up in Isaiah chapter uh, 21, we're in lesson 16. Uh, uh, vision 15 had occurred just a few days or even weeks prior to this vision that we're dealing with today. And the vision today, uh, ver vision uh, number 15, that the Lord is going to uh, send the Medes and the Persians to overtake Babylon. And that is just such a strange thing because the Medes and the Persians aren't even on the map and the Babylonian Empire is not even on the map uh, for all practical purposes. The Babylonian Empire uh, is going to rise to be a major nation, but at this point in time in the Assyrian Empire, the Medes and the Persians are actually a little stronger than the Babylonians, but they're all part of the Assyrian Empire. In fact, in next week's lesson, we're going to find out that these Persians are, make up the major part of the army that the king of Assyria brings and plants them right outside of Jerusalem and demands that Jerusalem open its uh, gates and allow them to come in. And if they don't, they're going to come and knock over the gates and they're going to conquer Jerusalem and conquer the southern empire. Well, we pick up here in... Uh, in chapter 21, uh, verse 21, uh, verse 1, it says, The oracle concerning the wilderness of the sea, as windstorms in the Negev sweep on, it comes from the wilderness, from a terrifying land. A harsh vision has been shown to me. The treacherous one still deals treacherously, and the sh destroyer still destroys. Isaiah is saying, I have seen this harsh vision. And this harsh vision is just proving to me that the Lord is still dealing with people and treacherous people are still dealing treacherously with people. Uh, you can say what you may, say what you might, but this world is just filled with evil people. Just filled with evil people who have their agenda uh, on on their mind all the time. I cannot imagine, I cannot uh, imagine in my wildest dreams why anyone in a society the way that we, that we live in would take a bomb and go blow it up in a public uh, charity race. I just, I just cannot understand that. I cannot understand anyone going to an airport with guns to try to shoot people. I just, I know it happens. I am prepared for it when it happens. I am aware that it is possible. But still something in my mind, I just do not understand or comprehend why anyone would think to do harm to someone else to do harm you know we all have things that we are fearful of we have something on our new car that I am fearful of I'm gonna tell you what it is no not the steering wheel our new car that my wife drives has these two automatic sliding doors that slide back you know that and I, it's a minivan, and I am so fearful because I know it's going to happen. It's just not if it's going to happen, it's a matter of when it's going to happen. They're going to be getting out of that car and put their hand like this while that front door is open on one of the other sides, and somebody in the front seat, either the driver me or Madison on the other side, we're going to shut that door on their hand. It's just going to happen. Oh it's just the way it's made. 
No, there's not a safety thing on that. No, there's not a safety thing on that. It's just the way it's going to happen. It's fearful. You say, why in the world are you fearful of things like that? Because those are just simple things we can be fearful about. Lo and behold, there are things that are not simple that we, can be, we should be fearful about, and we should be ready. Well, in this vision, Isaiah sees something that just alarms him. Alarms him beyond measure. Now, some of the um, commentators say that this is a vision about the wilderness of the Negev. Now, the Negev is down here south of uh, the Dead Sea. That's not what it's talking about. Down here in this wilderness area, the wind storms pick up, and when the wind blows, it literally just, that old sand just wipes the hide off of everything. I mean, just wipes it clean. And what Isaiah is saying here is he's seen this dream that is going to sweep through and destroy something just like those winds, these storms that come on down in the Gev will sweep through and wipe clean uh, everything that's there. You've seen it in movies where they're out in the uh, sandy areas and you see this storm coming of sand. And what you've got to do is you have got to get your face covered and you've got to get covered up because that sand is just going to going to tear the hide off of you and you're for a few minutes or for whatever time that wind is blowing you're going to start breathing that sand that sand's not good to get in your lungs and you better hide down somewhere that is safe and when you come up I guarantee you you're going to be covered with dust it's going to wipe clean everything around you well that's what he's talking about here and he sees that it is coming it says verse 2 he says go up Elam lay siege media I have made an end of all the groaning she has caused. She who? Who is the she? We're going to find that out in a little bit. This is talking about the country that's in control when the Lord calls for Elam and for Media to come up. Well, later on, we find out in history as we roll down, Elam and Media are the Persian Empire. And in 722, Elam and Media are under the control of the Assyrians along with what's called Babylon. And at the appropriate time, the Lord is going to call for the Medes and the Persians, or the Medes and Elamites, to wipe clean the nation of Babylon. And she's going to have to do it, and she's going to do it according to God's plan. Verse 3, For this reason my loins are full of anguish. Pains have seized me like the pains of a woman in labor. I am so bewildered I cannot hear. So terrified I cannot see. My mind reels. Horror overwhelms me. The twilight I long for has been turned for me into trembling. They set the table. They spread out the cloth. They eat. They drink. R rise up, captains. Oil the shields. Now I hope you do like I did. What in the world is he talking about? Well, if you know your scriptures, you know exactly what he's talking about. Isaiah is expressing his great anguish for the circumstances that are going to facilitate the need to destroy Babylon. He's going to need to destroy her because if the leadership of Babylon continues to stay in place, the leadership of Babylon will begin to hurt Israel. Isaiah sees... In this dream, when he says, they set the table, they spread the cloth, uh, they spread out the cloth, they eat, they drink, rise up, O captains, O shields. He sees the banquet that is going to occur 186 years after this vision. Daniel chapter 5 provides the actual details of the vision. Beelzeb, uh, Belshazzar is in charge of the empire. His father and his mother are on vacation. His father and mother were always on vacation, by the way, because there was a spot way down here uh, called the Oasis of Tima, and it was his father and mother's favorite place. And they were always there down in this Arabian Peninsula. Belshazzar throws this banquet. You know the story, Daniel chapter 5. For his lords and his nobles, it is a drunken brawl. Belshazzar calls 
for all of his leadership to go to the treasury of Belus, the god Belus, and to gather the utensils and bring them to the banquet hall, the utensils that his great-grandfather Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of Jerusalem before the temple was destroyed, and he put them in safekeeping in what's called the treasury of the god Belos in Babylon. It was the safest place for the treasury of the Lord, for the utensils that were used in the temple. Had they been placed in the treasury of Babylon, they would be just some more gold pieces that could be melted down, just some more silver that could have been hammered out for another purpose. But once they were put in the temple of Belus, a false god, everything in that treasury of Belus was considered sacred. Whether it was truly sacred or not did not matter. Because it was there, it was not up for grabs for any of the people to go and get and to use because it belonged, because Nebuchadnezzar had placed it there, and as he placed it there before he had turned to the Lord, it was there for protection. Can you imagine how God is that he will take something that is holy to him and he will put it in the protection of something that is ungodly and unholy? Now, does that make sense to you? It's exactly what God does. Exactly. God uses anything He wishes that is under His creation to accomplish the goals and the plans that He has made. Accomplish the goals. He sent Nebuchadnezzar, a reprobate to begin with, for the purpose of putting His people in line. That just does not make sense to me. It seemed like God would have sent a prophet to tell them what was fixing to happen. Well, He did. He sent several prophets. It's very interesting to me also. Daniel comes along and he's a prophet. He's not even born yet. He's not even going to be born for another 112 years after this prophecy is given. But when Daniel finally shows up, he gets taken out of the exile when he's about 17 years old. He gets taken over and put in the king's court. There's nothing wrong with Daniel. He's just a nice guy. Really nice guy. Lo and behold, king has a dream, needs to find out to what the dream is. Daniel comes over, he interprets the dream, his cream rises to the top, he, becomes, he gets put in charge of a second in command of the whole a nation of Babylon, emperor, empire of Babylon. Can you imagine that? You're Babylonian, you're Chaldean, and your cousins, the Jewish cousins of yours, uh, have just showed up and there's, a, there's a, a, a young brat over there by the name of Daniel, who's 17 years old, who uh, has just interpreted a dream and all of a sudden, a non-Chaldean is the second in charge of the entire Babylonian Empire. Does that seem fair? You know that everybody underneath Daniel, who was Chaldean, hated Daniel. Hated the prophet who interpreted the dream. But really and truly, Daniel does not deliver a single message of doom to the people of Israel. He only delivers messages that tell the future and of hope. Just like Joseph, you don't think about Joseph being a prophet, Joseph in the coat of many colors, but he really was because he could interpret dreams. And the Lord would tell him the answer to dreams. That's how he got out of jail. He's 17 years old when he's sold by his, from his brothers sell him to his Ishmaelite cousins and they take him down to Egypt and sell him to another cousin down there by the name of Potiphar. And Potiphar has him for a while taking care of his house and lo and behold has him thrown in jail. And it's not until he's 30 years of age that uh, uh, Joseph gets the opportunity to interpret a dream. But guess what? Along the way, along the way, Joseph has been so good in jail that he is put in charge of the jail. <laughs> even though he's a prisoner. Does that make sense? And so Joseph is, is hated by his brothers not because he's gone and done anything wrong and brought doom upon them, but because they just don't like him. And then you've got prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and Obadiah and Jonah and Habakkuk. And let's just go through the entire list. And these are people who are coming out and saying, Thus says the Lord God. You better straighten up your act or he's going to bring judgment up to you. There is not a single prophet besides Joseph and and Daniel that was liked by all the people. Samuel was not liked by all the people. Nathan was not liked by all the people. The true prophets of God were all hated by the common people. The world did not like people who were preaching and telling you what God had said. They found a reason to hate you. 
They find a reason to hate all of us. When we stand up as prophets or proclaimers of God to proclaim what God has said and to take care of business that God wants us to take care of, there are people all over the world who do not like us because we're not going along with the crowds and all of that. Not going along with all of this and all of that. I got so sick of listening to music on my radio when I was taking my daughter to school. I found me a news station, 92.1, J.P. Pritchard. I thought I've heard J.P. Pritchard all my life. I think I have, at least while I've been on Houston. And he's ended up on 92.1. And I'm thinking this is a good all news talk radio station. It's not going to be like that Fox station where they just yam, 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 because I'm just tired of yam, 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 yam. I don't want to be stirred up in my spirit like that. I know what's right and wrong, okay? So I'm listening to this station and Madison's in the car with me and lo and behold, they bring up this gay lesbian issue. And I think, okay, well, I'll live through this. Okay, I'm sure Madison knows about, you know, that. Okay. So then there's another story. And then lo and behold, here comes another gay and lesbian issue. And I know my attorney's back here thinking, how am I going to get you out of this hate crime thing that's going on? I'm just telling you what happened, all right? <laughs> just telling you. <laughs> on the fifth gay and lesbian news thing for the day, and none of them had anything to do with it, I finally turned the station off. I just turned the radio off. And I thought, you know... It really is true. Whether you get bad publicity or you get good publicity, all publicity is good for your cause. Because the more you hear about it, the less um, you get desensitized to it and you, you come to the point where you will just accept, oh, that's just the way it is. No, it's not the way it's supposed to be and I'm sick to my stomach of it. So later on that day, I try 92.1 in the evening, and they don't have any of those stories. Why were those stories important to be told in the morning, but they're not important to be told at 5 o'clock in the afternoon? I do not know. So the next morning, I'm taking her to school, and I turn on the radio, and lo and behold, it happens again. And you know, you can't listen to Channel 13 without having those same issues brought up at least one time. It's like every single broadcast has to have at least one of those issues in it, those gay and lesbian issues. Drives me crazy. Sin is sin, is wrong, is wrong, and why do we put it out there? And because it's not doing any good for us, and I am upset about it, I guess you can tell. <laughs> well, lo and behold, Isaiah is upset about this, and he is proclaiming it, and I know for good and well that none of the people like Isaiah. They don't like Isaiah. Every time Isaiah comes around, they're going, oh, here comes Isaiah. Oh, let's get out of the way because I don't want him to say anything about me because you know everything he says comes true. So lo and behold, I don't want to, no, please don't, no, 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 no. It's like the king, like uh, Amaziah, who uh, does not want Amos to come around. Oh, don't call Amos, no, because every time Amos comes around, he has something to say to me from God and it's never good. And it never is because they've done something wrong. Nobody likes the guy who's telling the truth. Why does this world not like the truth? Why, it offends them. Why is it that I have people who say to me on the phone and have said now, I called you for sympathy. I did not call you for the truth. <laughs> Thank you. Wrong number. <laughs> yeah, wrong number. And I try to say the truth as sweetly as I can. But... This happened several Wednesday nights ago. I talked about five hours with this guy, and finally he calls me back, and he's madder than the Dickens, and he said, I've been mad at you every time I've hung up from you. And he says, I called you for sympathy. I did not call you for the truth. I said, did you know the truth? Yeah, but I didn't want to face it right now. Okay. Isaiah is saying, look, this is coming. And Isaiah is talking about this banquet, and this banquet is happening. And, the, and what, lo and behold, Nebuchadnezzar has taken this treasury that belongs to Jerusalem. He's put it in the treasury of Belus, and it's safe there. But no, it's not safe because Belshazzar has committed an abomination. He has had all those cups and those forks 
and those knives and those utensils brought out and they're drinking a drunken brawl in that beautiful outside garden where it's got mosaic tile floor if you remember Daniel chapter 5. It's got those beautiful curtains that are hung all the way around the columns with gold rings and gold uh, cords that are holding it and inside there is that banquet going on for the women. Outside is for the nobles and, the men, and they're drinking, they're drunken. And the Lord is upset with them. So uh, they sit at the table. They spread out the cloth. They eat. They drink. So the Lord is calling the Medes and the Persians to bring judgment on Belshazzar that night. It's not a surprise to God. No, because the Persians have to come from over here to get to right here to be there at the right time. So when Belshazzar decides to send uh, to get the cups and the saucers, the Medes and the Persians are outside the door ready to come in that night. And the handwriting comes across the wall and they call Daniel to come in and say, tell us what this means. And Daniel looks at him and he reads it. And they all can read the words because it's in their language. They just don't understand the, me the meaning of it. And Daniel tells them and he says, Belshazzar, you have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. Daniel, Belshazzar says, thank you, Daniel. Because of that, I'll make you third in the kingdom. Why could he not be second in the kingdom now? Because Belshazzar is second in the kingdom. Because his daddy is first in the kingdom. Vacationing over in the oasis of Tima. Daniel says, you can keep your spot. It doesn't matter. Because tonight, your kingdom will be gone. And they are so drunk, they can't do anything about it. Daniel tells us about what's happening inside of the palace at the banquet. This is going on, verse 6 says, For this the Lord says to me, Go, station the outlook. Let him report what he sees. When he sees horse riders, horsemen in pairs, a train of donkeys, a train of camels, let him pay close attention, very close attention. Then the lookout called, and here's what he said, O oh Lord, I stand continually by day on the watchtower, and I am stationed every night at my guard post. Now behold, here comes a troop of riders, horsemen in pairs. The, the watchman is on the tower there in Babylon. He's stationed there day and night. And on this night, when the handwriting is on the wall, he sees these riders coming in pairs on camels and on horses. They have oiled up their, sheer, their shields. They have taken them. They're ready to come to battle. And sure enough, Isaiah is telling us the details of what's going to happen outside the walls. Daniel tells us what has happened inside the walls. Isaiah is telling us what happened outside the walls as the Lord is bringing this troop in from the Medes and the Persians. It is never a surprise to God of what is going to happen in just a few minutes in your life. He already knows it. It is never a surprise of what nation will come against another nation because he already knows about it. And in some cases, he has sent them. Sometimes in the Bible, a nation is coming against another nation and the Lord directs a different, a third nation to come and protect one of the nations. We can see those too. The Lord's never surprised. Listen, especially back in those days, you could not jump on an airplane or a C-5 or a transport or whatever kind of airplane you want and get your troops there as quickly as we can today. Back in those days, you had to make plans. You had to arrange the supplies. You had to load up the camels. You had to load up the donkeys. You had to load up the carts. And you had to walk and ride probably 20 to 25 miles per day across six or 700 miles or 300 miles or whatever it is to be in the right place at the right time to fulfill God's plan. And God had to persuade you to get there by persuading you to get there without you knowing it so that he could use you to do his will. The Medes and the Persians had no idea what they were doing. Oh, surely by now they could have if they had read back in Isaiah, but they didn't worship the same God. I don't think they had read Isaiah. Well, behold, here comes the troops. He hollers out, here comes the troops. But there's a problem. Nobody is sober enough in the banquet room, including Belshazzar, to give an order, to do anything. 9b. And one answered and said, Fallen, fallen is Babylon. There's the, that tells us who this oracle's to. 
All the images of her gods are shattered on the ground. O oh, my threshed people and my afflicted of the threshing floor, what I have heard from the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I make known to you. Isaiah is saying, O oh, you Israelites who are being threshed by Belshazzar, who are being thrust to the floor, those of you who are being damaged in your relationships, those of you who are hurting because of the way Babylon is beginning to treat you, Israelites, don't you worry about it. The time is over. The Lord is sending an avenger, a destroyer to destroy Babylon, and he is going to destroy him for the Lord. And lo and behold, his name is the nation of the Medes and the Persians, led by King Cyrus the Great. Under, with his general Darius the first, Darius the Mede, I'm sorry, and lo and behold, they're going to come in the night of the handwriting on the wall and Babylon is gone. And in fact, she is so fallen and she is so gone. You see there in picture number four, that is all that is left of her and that is a place for the jackals and the jackals, I guess is what it's called, and the birds and the vultures and the rats and any other type of little animal that can live out there with the scorpions, et cetera, et cetera, live. They have never built back over it. It is fallen. It is gone. It is over with. And lo and behold, Isaiah hears the news of the destruction decades before it actually occurs. Decades before it occurs. Really and truly, it's a hundred and... How many years? 50, 60, 170 years before it occurs. So we look at this. The Lord will send the Medes and the Persians to destroy the Babylonian Empire, capital city. Yep. And when does it happen? 536 B.C. Uh, actually, I told you wrong. Yeah, it's 170 years. That's right, 176 years. Vision 16. It says the oracle concerning Edom. Well, where's Edom? We come to the end of the Dead Sea and go south. Dead Sea, Edom, mountains of Edom. All right. One keeps calling me from Seir. Now, Seir is just a name for the mountain range that is there, the mountains that are there. Edom is the area. Seir is the mountain range. Watchman, how far gone is the night? Watchman, how far gone is the night? The watchman says, morning comes, but also night. If you would inquire, inquire, come back again. Well, most of you know, and some of you have probably even been there, this area called Edom in the mountain range of Seir. It's also called the mountain range of Paran. There's an old treasury building there of Petra. There's the picture of it. Some of you have been there. I know you have. And you've seen that treasury. Lo and behold, when you walk inside the doors of that treasury, it's just a big old square room. Do you know what has happened to the walls of that big old square room? They are filled with what? Who, somebody's been there. Come on. Israel, been to Pet, anybody of y'all been to Petra? Listen, okay, everybody that's been to Petra is in my 8 o'clock class. <laughs> it's filled with bullet holes because it's the treasury. And everybody thinks there's treasury hidden behind the rocks. So they filled the room with bullet holes trying to find where a bullet will go in and keep going to find a treasury that's carved out in the stone. There's other carvings also there in the Petra area that we know that, uh, that, so we, uh, th that we know of that are there on this mountain range. Well, this mountain range, Petra, it's Edom. It belongs to Esau. It's very interesting because Esau is 70 years old when his brother Jacob steals his birthright. Jacob runs, and for 20 years he's over in his uh, cousin's area, um, uh, Laban's area, and he sees this woman by the name of Rachel, and Jacob is 70 years old, and she is much younger, and he is so uh, in, in love with her to begin with when she draws water for him that he does the most inappropriate thing that a man could do back in those days. He kissed her without making a deal with, his, with her father. So he goes and makes the deal. I'll work for her for seven years. So he works seven years. That night in the wedding chamber, he doesn't get her. He gets her older sister. After all, the older sister has to be married first. He makes a deal, works seven more years for Rachel. Lo and behold, Leah, her, her older sister, does not bear children the entire seven years. He is over there for 14 years with no children by Leah. 
and no children by Rachel right off the bat, in fact. So they've given maids for them to have children with, if you remember. So Reuben is born and Simeon is born and they're born. And finally, he gets Rachel and he works another six years before she finally has one child by the name of Joseph. Jacob is 20 years old. I mean, is 90 years old. Joseph is a baby. He decides he's going to leave because his father-in-law has changed his wages year after year after year. His father-in-law doesn't want him to leave with his two daughters. But finally the deal is struck. And he goes and he sees Esau, his brother. He sees Esau and his brother, 90 years old, who had 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 his birthright stolen by this brother Jacob. Esau falls on Jacob's neck. He hugs him. He kisses him. I can imagine he says something like this, Brother, it's been too long and I've missed you. They begin living in the area together. And finally their families grow so large, according to the scripture, that Esau just simply picks up his family and moves out of that area and moves down to the area called Edom so that Jacob and his family can have all the rest of what's considered the promised land. Very interesting. So you see there in picture 6, that's the Seir mountain range. And you see in the picture 7 where the Edom is located across that. Now, in the original language, the word Edom is not the word that's used in the original language. I know it's here in our English translations. It is wrong in our English translations. The word is Duma in the original languages. <laughs> Duma or Eduma. And that word, the word uh, Edom means red. Esau means red. Edom means red. The word Duma means silent or stillness. And so we have to understand that in the original it's telling us by its name what this means. The area is according to Isaiah, is going to become Duma, silent or still. It is going to become abandoned. Now, since none of y'all have been to Petra, or if you have, you just showed up in the room, do you know what's in Petra right now? Nothing. It is silence or doom. Isaiah's prophecy has come true. It is silence and it's doom. When does it occur? It occurs when Assyria comes and swipes through Edom. She's trying to get to Jerusalem and the southern kingdom, but she can't take the southern kingdom. She can't get it, but she gets Edom, and Edom moves out of there in the face of being attacked by Assyria, and it's silent to this day. However, just a little tidbit, it's not in your lesson, they will return and they will make it a thriving city before the Lord returns. It's another prophecy. Not here, because he's only dealing with this one right here. But it's another one that will be coming. And the Lord is going to come to a place. And on this Seir mountain, they're going to rebuild a city and call it Tema. <clears throat> Tema. Got it? They're going to recall it Tema in the Mount Seir range area. And lo and behold, the Lord's going to come across there when he breaks through the eastern sky and he's going to destroy the Edomites there in their capital city before he destroys everyone at Armageddon. Another prophecy. Just a freebie there. Well, the historical records tell us that Tiglath Pilazar in 734 B.C. and Sargon II in 711 B.C. took taxes from the Edomites, had them under their thumb, and they, are, they had lost all their political power. And so, as the scripture says and the warning says, morning comes, but also night. If you would inquire, inquire. Come back again. Which means it's going to come back again. There's a call for it to come back again. But what he's saying here is, is Edom is going to be wiped clean. And sure enough, the fulfillment of this happens in 711 B.C. Edom is wiped clean. It has been the same way, the same way it stands right now is the way it has been since 711 B.C. <clears throat> well, pick up in verse 13. We have an oracle to, As to the Arabia. Uh, Assyria will defeat the tribes of Arabia and put them in subjection is the basis of where we're headed now, vision 17. 
the Oracle of Arabia. In the thickets of Arabia, you must spend the night. O caverns, caravans of the uh, Danites. Okay, the Danites were descendants of, of um, Ham, Sham, and Japheth, descendants of, Japheth, of Ham, and they are living right in this area. And they were caravan traders. And actually, they were protectors of car caravans. They owned the donkeys. They owned the cattle. And they would allow you to... Uh, uh, let's put it this way. They were the... Um, uh, uh, tr um, Central Freight Line of Arabia. You got that? Central Freight Line or Snyder Freight Line. They loaded up the 53-foot box trucks called Camels and you loaded your product on that and they would caravan that stuff and they would move. They were the truckers of the day except they trucked with hooves. Uh, big old huge hooves of cattle in fact. He says, oh spend the night Arabia, oh caravans of the Danites, bring water for the thirsty, oh inhabitants of the land of Tima. There we are, Tima. Oasis of Tima, meet the fugitives with bread, for they have fled from the sword, from the drawn sword, and from the bent bow, and from the press of battle. For thus the Lord said to me, in a year, as a hired man would count it, all the splendor of Kadar will terminate. Kadar is a town actually on this side. They were known for their tents that they made, beautiful black tents. They were the only ones who dyed their tents black. And if you could afford a Kadar tent, you were very wealthy. In a year as a hired man would count it, all the splendor of Kadar will terminate. And the remainder of the number of bowmen and the mighty men of the sons of Kadar will be few. For the Lord God of Israel has spoken. Well, in vision 17, Arabia will be the refuge for the caravans of Dedan. Dedan is right here. The Dedanites were the tribes in the southern central Arabian Peninsula near the western coastline. Tima is the beautiful oasis in the northwestern Arabia. Kadar is a city in northern Arabia. Uh, within a year, the northern kingdom will be defeated and the Assyrians' new king, Sargon II, will turn his attention to Arabia. So we know the time. We know that this starts in 722 B.C. Sargon II will turn his attention to Arabia. The Arabian Peninsula will suffer great defeat and run for their lives. Kadar will be destroyed. The Danites rush away in caravans. Tima will be as far away as they are able to run. The Dan is actually down just a little bit. As, the, as far as they're going to be able to run for their lives. And finally... Sargon will catch up with them. According to a 715 B.C. Sargonian uh, inscription on one of those little cone things that we talked about. There's one coming. Cyrus's cone, cone is coming. There's a cone of Nebuchadnezzar. There's one for Sargon. According to Sargon's inscription on his cone in 715 B.C., he says that he has completely accomplished his goal to defeat the Arabian tribes and bring them under his subjection. And he deports them. He deports them. Where does he deport these tribes? Well, lo and behold, he takes these tribes from, that he's captured and he moves them over into the northern area that he's just defeated called Samaria and now they're going to intermarry with the Jews who are left behind after the fallen kingdom. So, we look at the summary. Assyria will defeat the tribes of Arabia and put them in subjection. Absolutely. When is it fulfilled by? We know it is fulfilled by 715 B.C. Three visions. Boom, boom, boom. Medes and Persians don't even have any idea really who they are and why they're going to have power, but they're going to overrun the, meat, the Babylonian Empire. The Edomites are living in the Petra area but I, at this time of this vision, but Isaiah says you're going to be wiped clean and the area is going to be totally eliminated just like the, the, um, the wind blows through and the sands and erases everything. And sure enough, Edom is wiped clean. And the vision to Arabia. The Arabians are going to be taken over by the Assyrians and taken in control 
uh, by them and they will be in subjection and they will be moved into the area of Ephraim's old tribal land, capital city area of the northern, old northern kingdom and there they will live and there they will become part of the Samaritans that we will know as we all know about the Samaritan woman. Well, a shorter lesson today, but I'm sure it's, you will not uh, uh, hate me if I let you out early, right? I let you out early last week. I did. <laughs> yes, I did. I want to thank everybody who helped with the move yesterday. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, it was really sad uh, because one of the last things I said was, do we have our attorney here yet? And the attorney uh, wasn't quite there, and I thought, well, he'll know where we're going. Well, lo and behold, uh, Robert shows up, and somebody says the attorney's here. Robert Talton shows up, and I go, okay, but he just says the attorney. I was actually looking for the attorney, Milton Brock, I mean, Milton uh, Walker, and he was over at the other building. He, was, he waited. I mean, he didn't work a single thing. He waited uh, uh, waited for us over here for us to come pick him up. And by the time we got through, he was still waiting. <laughs> I was waiting for the wrong attorney. Oh, well. What we have here is failure to communicate. Yes, we do. Failure to communicate. That's right. Yes. You know, there are people who are very close to me who proclaim that I have that problem. Anyway, <laughs> let's pray. It's in my office. Yes, in my office. Here we go. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this time to come and worship and study your word. Lord, thank you so much for providing us proof every time we open the scripture that you're in charge. You are in charge. And nothing comes as a surprise to you. And even when things happen in our lives that we worry about, we don't need to worry about them because you're in charge. All we have to do is to trust in you Keep close to you so that you have no ought against us and you will provide for us. We love you for that, Lord. Help us when we fail. In your name, amen.